babe, can you? Welcome back to another Facebook Live. It's great to be back with you again this week. I've been off the last couple of weeks teaching, and so it's great to be back with our viewing audience. Uh, tonight we have a special guest we are very excited about, Jessica Truesdale. Um, she is an MSN, RN, WCC Wound Care Certified, and she specializes in burn treatment. So I am Denise Richland of Wound Care Gurus, and welcome to the show tonight. Let's bring Jessica out. Hey, Jessica. Hi, Denise. Hey, it's great to see you. How have you been? I've been great. It's great to be here. I'm very excited. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight, and I'm so excited about the information that you're going to be bringing our viewers tonight. We've had so many um, email us, contact us, ask us about burn specialties and burn treatment. So I know that our viewers are going to be just so excited and, and very informative tonight. Some really good stuff. So uh, let's start off and just um, tell us how you came to specialize in burn care. Well, it's kind of funny. When I was in nursing school, I'd, already pl I'd always planned on being with kids. Like pediatric nursing, I thought was my calling. And right. so I graduated, went to the closest pediatric institution to me, and I started floating so I could decide where I wanted to specialize. And once I got into like the ICU world, I was really excited about it. And then I found the burn ICU, and it just became this great passion because things changed all the time. It was always a new challenge, and you right. kept you on your toes. So whether we were taking care of the burn patients that day or we were assigned to the tub team where we just did dressings or we were assigned to like, um, we called it a resource person who was in charge of the burn triages that came in. Right, right. So your boy, that brings back memories. Um, my first rotation was in a burn center. And so that's kind of where my love of wound care developed. Um, I was, you know, I think the only PT in my class that had any interest in wound care at all. Uh, kind of the unicorn in the field, if you will. And uh, and I begged and begged to go to that burn center. And they just kept saying, you know, I don't know if therapy does a lot with wounds. And, you know, lo and behold, 30 some years later, you know, here we are. And you talked about a tub team. And boy, I can remember the day when we used to do the BID whirlpools and we scrubbed those whirlpools down. And I remember when we changed from betadine and to chlorazine. And I know I'm dating myself. Um, but that's what I'm so excited about tonight's information because I want to know all the latest tips and tricks and all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing I know is that even the terminology has completely changed. So when back in the day, um, you know, when we were doing burns, it was first, second and third degree burns. But I know that's somewhat different now. So why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, if you want to bring up that slide, okay. um, it has changed a little bit. Um, instead of the first, second, and third, um, we call it superficial, which is kind of the equivalent to the first degree burns that we had talked about before. We still use first, second, and third with lay people and with our patients and families. But that first degree burn or that superficial burn, as we call it, is like basically a sunburn. It's just into that epidermis. And it takes about five to seven days to heal. People usually get really itchy with it. Um, the second degree is actually now split into two different ones, and we have the superficial partial thickness, which is just in, it's through that epidermis and just a little bit into the dermal layer, usually the top third, and it's that either clear blisters or it's going to be that open, red, moist, pink area. Um, typically, these are one of the most painful burns that people have because their nerves are there and they're very much angry and raw. 
Deep partial is going from the top third layer of the dermis down further into the dermis. Um, so it's usually the same, it's an open area. Typically it's a little bit drier and it's lighter in color. So it's like that light pink to marbled area. They still feel it, it still definitely hurts, but it's not gonna be as painful as what the superficial burn or the superficial partial thickness burns are. And then we have the full thickness burns is what we used to call third degree burns. And those are the ones that are all the way through the epidermis and the dermis and into the subcutaneous layers. These ones typically have little to no pain because they don't feel it anymore. Those nerves have been fried a little bit. Um, the third degree burns will require surgical intervention to heal those full thickness ones. Um, or it could take months to years and they'll heal with contractures. So surgical intervention is typically the route most burn centers go. Okay, great. Thanks for, thanks for bringing that back to us and explaining it. I love the way you use that secondary burn split in the two. I'm going to use that when I teach now. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, when we talk about superficial and a sunburn, I think that's easy to grasp. And when you talk about full and a third, degree we get it but that I love that illustration um, that just explained it so clearly so clearly I appreciate that so um, there, go ahead I was like when I talk to patients I'm like it's like a two and a half <laughs> like, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense right <laughs> yeah and if you still feel anything even if it hurts that's actually a good thing right yeah. I, that's not like what it. you to experience right mm -hmm. yeah so, okay, there's also different types of burns, um, you know, thermal, chemical, electrical. Why don't you talk about some of the differences? Maybe there's different approaches, how they look. Yeah, um, thermal burns, um, they can, it involves heat. So they could be scald burns, they could be flame burns, they also could be like contact burns. <laughs> um, typically, um, the flame burns or anything thermal, they're uniform, with the exception of scalds. Scalds typically, if it's water, will go on hot in the first place, and then the like the burn will kind of lessen as it goes down because it cools off really fast. Okay, um, grease and different like molten aluminums or molten molten metals, those ones typically stay deep. Um, flame burns are typically deep and dirty, so they're usually open. We typically don't see a lot of blisters. We usually see a lot of charring with those. Okay. Um, chemical burns are fun because it's like a kind of a detective kind of game that you get to play because you get to figure out what the chemical is and right. if there's a neutralizer. Ah, I see. Okay. Um, usually if there's a neutralizer, like um, glucy, uh, calcium gluconate is really good for hydro, hydrofluoric acid. Okay. And so other burns, we'll figure out if we can neutralize it with water or it has to be something else depending on the chemical, depends on how deep it is. Um, one of the most interesting chemical burns is actually uh, concrete. It's oh, I thought of that. Alkaline burn. Okay. And alkaline or alkalotic chemicals or substances like concrete actually burn deeper than acidic, which we don't normally think of as, as acids burning less than what a base does. I wouldn't have thought that either. I wouldn't. So how do you neutralize concrete? Just out of curiosity, does it stuck to the skin at that point? Uh, usually for the concrete, it's the guys who are laying it. Mm -hmm. And what they'll do is they'll wear jeans or they'll wear some kind of like cloth material over their knees and they'll right. continue to go over top of it. And so they just kind of sit on that wet concrete. So it's not necessarily even the concrete touching them. It's the chemical that mixes with that concrete. Sure. So we... Usually by the time we get them, it's days later and it's really deep because okay. they don't change. Good to know. Good to know. Anybody out there who's got a family that lays concrete, you don't want to sit in the wet concrete juice, if you will, right? Huh. I wouldn't have thought that. I wouldn't have thought that. So. Mm -hmm. And then finally, cool. electric burns. Mm -hmm. Those ones are always interesting because they have an entrance and an exit. So most of their damage is actually internal. And the biggest concerns we have is if their entrance is on one side of their body and the exit is on the other side. Because that traveling from like your hand to your foot is traveling through your heart. And so your heart is a very big electrical system. So we have, we watch a lot of cardiac things going on, whether they're going having like 
basically it's kind of like a heart attack. It'll kind of mimic. Oh God. Um, but their exits are always worse than their entrances. And their exits typically are like fingers, knees, and toes. Mm -hmm. I know one of the worst um, electrical burns I did see was a, and this again, back in the day, um, I think they've even changed bucket trucks um, considerably since then. But at that time he had reached onto a wire and was leaning against the bucket truck and it wasn't grounded or the part of the insulated had, had peeled off or whatever. And he had a giant exit wound on his midsection. And I just felt for the poor guy because I thought, oh, wow, that it's going to be years, years and years and maybe never back to normal. So uh, I, I can I can sympathize and, and uh, it, it even brings back to my mind poignantly, you know, what you're talking about there. So um, so that gives us um, an idea of some of those burns out there. When do we know when to come to a burn center? You know, somebody's got a burn. Maybe they call us because they know that we work with wounds. And it's like, hey, we've got a burn. How do we know when to refer somebody? Or if a family is watching this, how do they know when to bring somebody to a burn center? Well, there's a couple things. There is actual guidelines put out by the American Burn Association, the ABA, which is on that slide I sent you. Okay. Um, typically, burns that are greater than 10% of the body is something that we would see no matter if it's a kid or an adult. Um, burns that involve the face, hands, feet, genitalia, or major joints, third degree burns in any age group, electrical burns, um, chemical burns that are typically third degree burns we will see, or if they're splash burns, so the bigger chemical burns, any inhalation injury they recommend, as well as um, burn patients who have comorbid conditions that the burn is gonna complicate things, or if they're a trauma burn, if the burn is outweighing the trauma, they would go to a burn center before a trauma center. Um, or like in some cases, like if it's a pediatric patient and you're in an adult institution and they're not qualified to take care of children, I would send them definitely to a regional burn center. Um, and then any patient who requires extra care. So special needs that may be more burn focused. So whether their house burnt down or there are other issues in the house, whether it's an abuse or um, just kind of social work kind of stuff, they'll also send. Sure. Sure. We see a lot of patients who um, get referred to us just because some physicians aren't very comfortable with burns because burns are a little bit different than typical like acute wounds that you would see just because of the etiology. Um, any circumferential burns, we also recommend that you go to a burn center just because you don't want the um, possibility of like losing that pulse or losing that limb. Right, right. That brings up a, a term when they do those escherotomies. That's what you're talking about, isn't it? Right. Yeah. And they, the, yeah. Tell us about that. So an escherotomy happens when you have a patient who has a burn that's all the way around a limb or a torso. Um, typically, we do them more on the torsos or the limbs. And what happens is, is that the burn is so tight that it's actually pushing right. on organs that are swelling. So your muscles are swelling just because of the injury and it's cutting off supply. And once you lose a pulse in a limb, you actually have eight hours to get it back. So if you have a patient at an outlying ER, you do not have to do the escherotomies there. You can actually send them to the burn center because you have eight hours from pulse loss. Good. And what those, yeah. And what they'll do is they'll take a bovie knife and they will cut um, lateral and medial to it so that it'll allow it to expand. And typically that is done by a physician or a resident. Eight hours, I'm gonna write that down. That's other. That's great information. That is just good to know to pass on. So we also have a question coming up and it's asking, is frostbite considered a thermal burn? We do not technically list it as a thermal burn but we do care for them in burn centers. Okay. We have different protocols in place for them. Okay, okay, good to know, good to know. All right, so when we're looking for those burn centers, I know you mentioned like if it's a pediatric patient to make sure that we look for a regional center that will help us with pediatric patients, but how, um, how, what do we look for in a burn, good burn center? You know, it, if we have more than one option, how would we know what to choose? Well, what I recommend is going to the American Burn Association's website, and they list every single 
um, verified burn center. You do want to send your family member or your patient to a verified burn center. It means they had to go through, you know, all the hoops to ensure that the care they provide is top notch. Um, the difference between like uh, an adult or a pediatric burn center and a regional burn center is that regional burn centers do treat both adults and pediatrics. So they specialize in both, which is nice. Um, but choosing a burn center over the other, I would be just be a really good consumer and I would look at reviews. Okay, no, but, appreciate that. Yeah. Appreciate that, great, great, okay. So now let's talk treatment. You know, we've talked about how do we refer and when to know and how to pick. So what should we expect? Let's start, I tell you what, let's start first if we've got a burn at home and it's more superficial or it's superficial partial thickening, it doesn't have to be referred. What are some good treatments for those burns that we might treat at home? Okay, so my favorite, because um, we always have these like uh, like things that we've always heard you should do. Right. Old <laughs> so much. Sure. So I recommend anything that you would put on food or cook with, you do not put on your burn. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, I've heard mustard and butter, um, lots of fun things. Or tea bag. Uh, yeah. Or um, people like to relieve the pressure of blisters and stick a pin in it. Don't stick a pin in your blister. Um, one of the physicians that I work with, and I'll never forget this after he said this, um, was that the blisters that are created are God's biological band-aids. Love so it. It's a perfect covering, so don't poke a hole in the band-aid. And what we, would, what we encourage is if you do have a blister, just to keep it protected, and after a week, or two weeks, it should actually like flatten off a lot and you could peel it off. Right. Um, but keeping it clean and covered, you can put an ointment on it if it is open and moist. Um, any ointment really would work as long as it is not, once again, butter or mustard <laughs> or honey. Um, so like an over-the-counter antibiotic or do you have yeah. any suggestions, anything? Right. We, uh, <laughs> At my house, we use multiple things. <laughs> I use different <laughs> over-the-counter antibiotics. I've used different um, just kind of natural healing ointments that I've used that doesn't necessarily have an antibiotic in it, but it's like an emollient that keeps it nice and moist. Um, but the go-to we usually use in the burn center for like our patients is like bacitracin, so an antibiotic ointment, and we'll cover it up, especially if it has the risk of getting dirty. Right, fantastic, great, great tips, great tips. So, all right, that tells us how to treat burns at home if we're gonna, you know, D DIY it. Um, so what about those treatments in your burn center? What do those look like? Talk to us about what's happening there and our wound care clinicians that might, you know, need to treat some burns if they don't have a burn center handy for them. Right, um, so there's a couple trains of thought. The, mm -hmm. we usually do, um, Daily is what has been the norm fine, like for the last couple of years was that we would use like uh, bacitracin or um, we've used different products like Glucam Pro. So not necessarily an antibiotic, but still like an emollient, covered it, did a daily dressing with that. The burn world is kind of catching up with the wound world and we're heading more towards that silver product and using dressings that last a couple days. Mm -hmm. So um, silvers are coming in pretty hot right now and using like every three days, every seven days, depending on the products, or even using the new silver gels we've been starting to use a lot. Okay. All right. Good. Good information. So um, I know, you know, you're talking about daily. I can remember we were continually looking for signs and symptoms of complications. So let's kind of talk about that. What should we be looking for with these burns? What are you looking for? So for patients that um, are kind of have those minimal burns that aren't necessarily staying overnight, we're looking for signs of infection. So we're looking for redness around the burn. We're looking for um, usually patients who have burns have a lot of pain. So we're looking for like GI complications as well. And we look for that in our adult patients or our inpatients as well, making sure that their gut's still working. So we will give them um, proton pump inhibitors or some kind of H2 blocker just to make sure that their stomach is protected from the medications we give. Um, okay. When you burn, your GI tract is also um, involved, which is not something we usually think about first. Yeah. 
And so we do a lot to protect the gut health. Um, looking at different fluids and proteins in patients, uh, typically have a nutrition consult straight from the get-go, as well as like an OTPT consult or therapy consults, so that everybody can get involved early so we can develop the best kind of plans for them. So tell, tell me, just because I'm a therapist, uh, and I want to do a shout out, because believe it or not, we have a lot of therapists that tune in. Um, so talk, talk us through that. I know back in the day, again, we used to do a lot of splinting, a lot of scar massage. We, we constructed these fantastic outrigger splints. Those were so much fun. But tell us what's happening in your therapy world with your burns. Oh, I love our therapists. Usually they start in the, like early, so we get people up and walking. Um, for our, like our patients who have hand burns, they're great about getting splints. We have them making splints up in the OR for our patients. Um, for and even like as they progress and we put them in the outpatient burn center, they still come up and we do therapies with them. They'll do different scar massage. They'll work on um, contractures because believe it or not, not every patient we have is compliant. So our therapists work a lot, right? <laughs> With our scar management, and they they do a lot with trying to stretch that out so we can avoid doing those releases early, sure. and possibly at all, which is great. Right. Now, you're mentioning a release, so talk to us about that. What does that mean? So, a contractual release is a patient who typically develops a, it's like a scar band almost, and it'll develop typically on like an arm or a neck, and what it does is it hinders your range of motion. And so what they'll do if they can't, if our therapist can't like massage it out or get them to stretch it out with our different splints is that the surgeons will go in and they'll actually cut it and we'll graft that area to allow it to grow and to release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say, now do you still, do they still use like silicone pads and things to, to push and, and compression and all that on the scars or is that outdated now? No, they still do that. We have silicone, different silicone masks and inserts, um, different pressure garments. And so typically when our patients get really close to not having dressings on, our therapist will come up and they'll measure them for their garments so that it's specially made to each little inch of their body. And right. the patient will wear those for 23 hours a day typically. Okay. All right. And, and how long do they wear those now? How long are you, are you following patients? you know, different than acute or chronic wounds. This is a much longer period of time, right? Yes. So um, we will see them typically until they are completely healed, 100%. And then the individual patient will follow up in the surgeon's offices. And they typically will follow up every six months for a year, and then they will follow up yearly. If they start having any issues or contractures noted, then they'll bring them back sooner so sometimes it's up to monthly depending on what they're watching okay and so how long would we look for those contractures is how, how far out um typically it's patient dependent to be honest it depends on how compliant the patient is with right. um, their exercises and their stretching i've seen patients get releases within a month of them healing and then i've seen them get releases years down the road uh, so, it's, so it depends on how they develop Right, and it can be a, it's a forever situation sometimes for some of them, right? Yes, especially our pediatric patients because the skin grafts don't grow and stretch as much as normal skin, their natural skin was. Um, so sometimes we'll do multiple releases on kids as they grow. Oh, uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I had another um, question texted into me too. So do we always treat um, burns with antibiotics or how do we know when we should either topical or systemic I'll let you talk to that um, systemic we never give prophylactic systemic antibiotics so like we don't okay. do oral antibiotics unless we truly have an infection so they need to have those signs that we've all learned about that needs to be a systemic infection. Right. Um, depending on the burn depends a lot on what we'll put on it. Typically, um, the go-to is like a bacitracin or an antibiotic ointment that we'll change daily. Um, sometimes they won't, but typically our patients who are, especially an outpatient, don't always behave like they're supposed to. And so we want to make sure that we're getting it some kind of clean because they usually start developing redness around it with by the time they come in and see us. Mm -hmm. um, but 
it just kind of is provider dependent a lot, but typically the go-to is bacitracin and cutisarin. We rarely use psilidine, which is used to be like the go-to burn cream. It that, was cupcake fluff. That's right. Yes. And we stopped using that a lot because the sulfa antibiotic in it is, is strong. It's a powerful antibiotic and we don't necessarily need it. So they'll save that for some of our dirtier burns. So like our flame burns who like fell into a bonfire that are deep, right. it'll help soften up that eschar before the patient goes to surgery before we can do like debridements on it. Um, but typically like the lessers will use Bactroban um, and Bacitracin a lot. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So, and then, you you know, because you're a regional, but it treats adults and pediatrics both kind of speak to, or is there differences uh, in your pediatric population in the treatments or in the philosophy? Um, I don't know if we have different treatments or philosophies. I know if we have a big burn come in, that is a pediatric, we do resuscitate them different just because kids need that extra sugar. So we will do that. Um, like the resuscitation fluid, but then we will also add our um, D5 or some kind of sugar to them so that they don't drop because they usually have a potential to get dehydrated a lot faster. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. So. We play a lot of games with the kids <laughs> when we do their dressing. Right. So, um, and I'm going to reach out to the audience here and say, if you have any questions as we're getting to the end here, if you have any questions for Jessica, please type them in. We want to make sure to get to your questions before the end of the broadcast. So Jessica, anything else that you could tell us about um, how we as wound care clinicians can support you in the burn centers or anything we can do to help or other thoughts that we haven't covered yet? Um, I think just calling and asking questions because a lot of times we'll have we'll have different clinics call us and be like we have this weird burn um just being willing to reach out and ask those questions i know when i took the wound care certification class i think seven years ago i learned so much about the wound care world outside of burns because that's what i was introduced to and i didn't even realize all of the differences and so it's great to be able to talk to different people and get different views and kind of like what's going on. So I highly encourage networking and just being part of the team, even with like our home care people, they call a lot and ask questions about what's normal and what's not normal because burns do kind of look weird sometimes. Mm -hmm. They can, they can. I know I, I had an episode with a neighbor, uh, one of our neighbor's sons uh, fell into a bonfire last summer. And uh, it was one of those where I had to recall my skills and then I'm back to opening up my WCC book, like, okay, what else, what do I not remember about Burns and, and all that? So um, we appreciate you guys and we appreciate being able to call. And he wasn't so severe that we needed to move him on, but I certainly wanted to make sure I was doing the right things for him. So I think I've got a question. So, all right. It says, can you teach me about Integra skin grafts and resell? When are they used and what types of burns? Ooh. Those are fun questions. Um, <laughs> so Integra is kind of, I believe it's the, sh the shark cartilage. And so it helps build, it helps create that kind of scaffold to the skin. It's not going to be a permanent thing. It just helps with those building blocks and you will graft over top of it. Resell is newer. I have not worked a lot with resell to be honest, but, um, it is something that is coming into the different uh, burn centers, and I know they're using it a lot more. Integra, I used more in the beginning of my career than I've seen like in the last eight years um, because it gets infected really easily. So it has to be a very clean debridement. Um, I've seen it, I've only ever seen it on third degree burns, and it's usually after surgical debridement and lots of Lots of TLC. It's something that you have to definitely like do really good aseptic wound care on it. Okay. Appreciate that input. That's something that we can uh, research and message you back to. Um, Alan, appreciate you that question. Uh, do you see mostly split thickness skin grafts or is there different types of grafting? What are you seeing now in the burn centers? Um, depending on the 
depending on how deep the burn is, kind of depends. And like the location, they'll do full thickness skin grafts if they can, just because it kind of heals a little bit better. And even if it doesn't, um, sorry, even if it doesn't take 100%, it still will, it still will have those building cells at the bottom. So they tend to look a little bit nicer, but they're usually on smaller parts of the body because full thickness wraps, they'll usually like take a whole piece of skin out and then they will start, like they'll suture it shut. So oh. they tend to be on smaller deep burns. Split thickness is usually the way they go okay. on bigger areas. And so if you have a patient that's, you know, 25 up to 50, is there is there a, a measurement or a any criteria as far as, you know, the rule of quarters or anything like that that we would go by on, on how things are drafted? Um, it's kind of mostly physician preference. I've sure. seen some, proficient, some physicians who will do a full thickness graft on something that is two inches and they won't do it on something bigger. And I've seen some do it a little bit bigger where it's like three or five inches. Um, but typically they'll do the split thickness just because it's um, a little bit more forgiving and they can take less skin and they'll stick it through a dermatome or a measure that will kind of stretch it out. And so they can take less skin because if they graft a patient, they'll take like a superficial burn almost area for that donor site. And so we still have another wound we have to heal on top of it. Um, they usually mesh everything with the exception to the face and hands, the back of the hands. They'll typically use what we call sheet grafts. And that's just cosmetic purposes that it looks a little bit better, but you have to watch because blood can develop underneath them. So we want to make sure it stays nice, flat, and pink. Now, what's a sheet graft made of? A sheet graft is made out of their normal skin. Um, they'll take the top layer. Thickness, okay. Yeah, they'll take the same thickness. They just won't stick it through that mesher. So it doesn't have that, what I call basketball short kind of look. Right, I understand. Yeah, the little pock marks where they stretched it or meshed it out. I understand what you're saying. So, okay, that makes sense to me. That's, now, what other types of grafting materials are you using for those bigger areas? If they can't donate their own skin, then what are, what are we looking at? Then what we'll do is they'll usually harvest what they can from the patient and they will graft, they'll use auto graft, which is the skin from yourself mm -hmm. um, as much as possible. And then if you they run out of skin, they will cover the patient in cadaver skin or pig skin okay. usually. And those are just temporary coverings, they have to come off eventually because your body will not take them because your skin is still an organ. So usually what they'll do is wait till part of their old donor site heals and they'll actually reharvest from there. Oh, okay. How quickly would they be able to reharvest there? Um, usually two weeks, two to three weeks. They can reharvest if once they get it healed, they'll wait a little bit, but they'll harvest as much as they can. Yeah, that could be agonizing, I would imagine. Um, Wow, yeah. and long, a uh, long-term process for them. So now, will they stay with you that whole time as an inpatient, or is that when they would be doing outpatients if they're to that grafting stage? Um, it, it once again kind of depends on like the size of their burn. If they're a smaller burn, who's going to get grafted? Usually, we'll keep them an outpatient for most of the time. If they're greater than ten percent. We'll put them inside so that they can get their graft done. And then what will happen usually is that we'll graft them and wait five days. And then we'll take the graft down just to look at it and make sure everything is great. And then take out whatever securement they use. Usually they use staples. Some physicians are sewing. So we'll check that out. If they can take out the staples, they'll take those out. And then we'll send the patient home. Their donor site at that point is the biggest issue, issue typically. It's the biggest pain. So... I think one of the biggest things I learned was making sure that patients understood that when they go into surgery for their graft, that their burn isn't going to hurt anymore. It's really not going to be a problem. It's their donor site that's going to be on fire. It's where they're going to take that skin from. So um, typically that will take one to two weeks, sometimes three weeks, depending on how big. Mm -hmm. And boy, it does too. They really talk about that. They'll talk about how their donor site is much worse than the burn. Yes. Um, I can remember that. Yeah. So uh, now I've also heard of different places putting negative pressure on those grafts. Is that something that you guys use? Have you heard of it? What's the, what's the buzz out there in the field for that? All right. Well, that also, some, some physicians are all about it and some are not. Typically, we will see 
um, those negative pressure backs on patients who we are grafting an area that might not be as vascular. So whether it's like a deep hand burn that they're trying to make sure that it's taking really well, it just kind of helps pull that granulation tissue up into that graft so sure. that it can take. Right. Right. Yeah. There's nothing worse than going through all of the, the harvest and the donor pain and all that to have your graft fail. So right. what's uh, any other tips you would have for us for people who might have those grafts? What, what are we really watching for? What should they do? Um, when you have the grafts, you want to make sure that they look nice and pink. Okay. Um, in the beginning, they should look nice and pink and bright. Some the edges will always look a little bit discolored, and that's because when you graft it, you have overgraft, so you have to take the graft and secure it to good skin. So okay. there's always like a layer of scabbing or dead skin around it that people will notice. And then once it matures, um, it's important to keep it moist, like lotion. So we'll have, once the graft is completely filled in and nice and healed, keeping it moist and keeping um, like lotion on it and making sure you rub it in completely and not um, letting it dry out too much is really important. And then um, one of the biggest things to remember is once you're healed, your skin kind of becomes like a mood ring. Like when we were kids, we all had these like mood rings that change color with heat. Well, their burns do the same thing. Oh gosh. And, and it kind of freaks them out sometimes, but it's completely normal for like six to eight months, even a year afterwards, that if it gets really cold outside, their burn will turn different colors. Or even if it gets hot and it blanches out, it just kind of depends. And it's not anything to worry about. The skin's not gonna fall off. It's yours, it's there, it's happy. Um, but it's a little disarming for people and it always looks worse than what it really is. I can imagine. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because, you know, even taking histories, um, you know, as, as just a wound clinician, you know, now I will say, huh, have you had a burn? Have, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that tip. So we have another question as well. It says, is there a good donor site dressing these days? Something that lessens the pain and helps it heal better or faster? Um, personally, the ones that I've seen that, um, I think are works the best is we've had uh, physicians use offsite, okay. which is not what you would think typically of a wound dressing, but they will put offsite over the wound dressing and it will flow with fluid, but it has that temporary covering feel. So they don't have as much pain with it because nothing is rubbing it. As long as that stays intact, it's amazing. If it leaks, it is not. <laughs> um, then we also have used um, like a foam silver, like Mepilex AG. I don't, I, um, that one stays on for seven days. It's really nice. Okay. Uh, but patients typically get a little ouchy when you're taking it off on that seventh day, just because those edges tend to stick a little bit. But um, those are the ones that I have found to be the best pain wise and ones they don't have to touch. Hey, thanks for sharing your experience. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Okay, so last call for questions from the field, and then we will wrap up. Um, Jessica, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm just thrilled with all the new knowledge, um, with you sharing your specialty with us. Like I said, I know that you have helped so many clinicians tonight, uh, myself included. So I really appreciate your time, and I'm so glad that you came on with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I had a great time. I appreciate it. Any last words of wisdom for us? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Wound care with burns is the same as everything else. It's always great to like research and find new things. There's never one correct answer for anything, especially with burns. There's always different things to use and sometimes things work on one person and not the other. So it's always fun to try and don't be afraid to try new products. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. So Jessica Truesdale, oh, so fantastic. Thanks. That is a wrap for tonight and we will be seeing you again. Check us out on our Facebook and Instagram, Wound Care Gurus. All right. Thank you. God bless and heal on.